days are short and the nights are long Where they walk and I walk They twist and I twist They shimmy and I shimmy They fly and I fly Well, they're out there having fun In that one California sun Well, I'm going out of west out on the coast Where the California girls are really the most A pretty little chick wherever you go The purpose of high school is to just kind of get you ready for the next step. It's a chance to make mistakes without being completely penalized for them. My name is Nicole Goya and I am a senior at West High School. It's a chance to learn the basics before moving on to college or to a vocational school where you'll learn to what you're going to do for the rest of your life? Uh, the purpose of high school is to prepare a student for uh, life. Simply enough. Uh, my name is Philip Drazer and I am a counselor at West High School in Torrance, California. I work with the students to try and prepare them for the next phase of their life. I don't think a lot of high schools adequately prepare students for careers. I think there's a major push constantly for college readiness, college readiness, college readiness, and for students that may not desire to go directly to college after high school, there is very little that is offered to prepare them for the world of work. I think it would be important to give them uh, skills, to teach them skills that they need for jobs. Uh, for example, at this high school, which is a highly academic high school, there's not one computer class. Uh, this is 2011, and the fact that we do not have a computer class on this campus is, um, I, I don't know what the right word is, um, it, it's mind-boggling for me to believe that, that there's no computer class. There are very few classes that are offered on this particular campus, and in Torrance in general, uh, that prepare kids to have skills that they need to go into the workforce. We teach um, nutrition, cooking, um, cooking skills, lots of measurement, and reading recipes. I'm Kelly Brin, and I'm the food science teacher at West. As far as preparing for life after high school, we talk about a lot of nutrition, um, nutrition through the ages, because a lot of kids don't quite understand what eating appropriately is. Um, portion control, we touch on all of that, which is something that's very important. Um, not only now in high school, but as they grow up and maybe eventually raise families. Well, in our Art One classes, it's a little more basic. We're really skill building, but in every lesson, we try to leave a creative component so that there's ownership to the project. I'm Mrs. Lange, and I teach art at West High School, drawing and painting, one, two, three, four, and AP Studio Art. In the more advanced levels, we get more conceptual, so they're much more creative. They can add more elements to it, and again, it just adds more to their creativity and what they produce in their own artworks. Well, you're comparing two, two, two entirely different classes because 
when you talk about electives, you're talking about art, the arts in the class, and as you're talking about academic classes, you're talking about math, science, you know, those kind of things. Uh, I'm Nate Thomer. Uh I'm a senior at West High. Electives are just as important as academic classes because you can't let somebody be completely intellectual without giving them some kind of outlet to be uh, creative and inspired, you know what I mean? A well-balanced person will have a mixture of both of those. So it, it, the fact that it's going away is showing how we're leaning more towards you must get a higher paying job than everyone else around you and you must take the harder classes, not because you want to learn, just because you want to make more money or not necessarily help anybody. I'm, you know, that's a generality though, but I, I completely disagree with it. They take the classes that they're supposed to take, that their parents want them to take, and they don't want to disappoint their parents, and it's all about uh, getting someplace. Uh, getting someplace is, is, is great, uh, but it's not just about getting someplace. You need to enjoy the you need to enjoy the journey. And when I register a kid, and the first question to me is, which one do you get the extra point for? They're they're not they're not learning for the sake of learning. They're learning for the sake of getting ahead of the person that may not have had, because it's all about the best school. Because they don't know where they're going. They just know that they're supposed to go to the best school. Um, and wh who's to say what the best school is? You know, the best school is the school that fits you best. It's not, there, there isn't a list of the best schools for you. There's a list of the best schools, but I don't know what the criteria is that they, they judge those best schools on. You know? Best school for, for somebody may be Harvard, but the best school for some, somebody else may be El Camino College. Um, and that person might be eligible to get into Harvard, but it's not what they feel is best for them right now. So, you know, do what you need to do, not what you think other people expect you to do. Yeah, unfortunately, there's, you know, a lot of pressure on students to want to go to a good college. Uh, ben Egan, I'm principal at West High School. Um, even colleges that might not normally have been known as the best colleges are extremely competitive to get in now, so um, pressure is on. Once they move on to college, you know, it's harder to get those elective classes in. Um, so having them in high school is very beneficial. Um, it lets the students see what's out there as far as other opportunities um, rather than just your basic math, science, English classes um, that, they're, that they have to take. So being able to take an elective course can really show them other things that are out there. Depends on what the electives are and the interest level of the student. I definitely think that school shouldn't just be um, scholastically driven. I think that um, math and reading, of course, are very, very important as well as um, English and writing skills. But in art, we do many of those things also. So I think there's a crossover. And I think sometimes taking those electives helps students that aren't so scholastically driven to then go, oh, maybe school is a place for me and there's something that I can do and then they'll get those other things to come with them through the arts or through music or through acting or singing or dancing or something else. So I think that they have a really important purpose because not everyone's going to feel intellectually driven and so sometimes that art is going to give them the inspiration to find um, a career and go to school just because they've taken an art class or a music class or something else. Um, I don't think most kids know what it's like to work. I don't think they know what's needed to work. I don't think they know how to create a resume. I don't think they know that they should dress appropriately when they go for an interview. I don't think they know what the word appropriately means for dressing for an interview. Through these, the classes that I teach, the elective courses, um, it's really just kind of showing them what's going to be going on later in life. Um, family psychology and survival of singles really pull into that, what's going to happen after high school, you know, getting a job, um, moving out, all that kind of stuff is what we focus on in survival. And then in family psychology, really focus on, you know, um, dating, marriage, um, having children, which is all something that will kind of progress right after high school. Um, I think that an elective course done well is on par with an academic course. I'm Ryan Donahue. I'm a senior here at West High. 
So I think that if you're interested in art, then a well-done art course is just as important as a well-done calculus course for somebody who wants to be an engineer. Or if you're taking a shop class and you want to become a carpenter or something like that, that's just as important to you as it might be for um, a bio person to, who wants to be a doctor. I think the more you can take to expand your knowledge in a variety of areas will help you decide uh, what it is you like so you can find your passion. And whatever it is you're passionate about will serve you best in the future. You need to find what you're passionate about so you can be happy. I don't think electives are a way out of taking more challenging classes. I think that electives can be a way for kids to explore um, other options and opportunities because not everybody is going to grow up to be a an electrician or um, like a, an engineer or um, something in a, like a math related, science related field. So having elective courses does show different types of careers that are possibly out there um, for the student who's not going to be college bound or may be interested in a trade school instead. I think that the students who are more likely to take those uh, more career oriented courses are probably not the students who are very interested in pursuing higher education. So I think that um, it's not the classes themselves, but just the kind of people who take the classes. I would say so, yeah, because society's put a lot of emphasis on the fact that if you don't have a lot of money, and if you're not making, or I'm sorry, if you don't have a lot of money and you don't have a really nice job, you don't drive a nice car and live in a nice house with a pretty wife or husband or whatever, then you're useless to society, which is why there's a dwindling number in the amount of like people that work, that construction workers, people who work on, you know, uh, the things that make your lives easier that we don't even think about. There's a lot less of those people because they're the unsung heroes of society. So it, they don't get as much recognition that they know, and society can't, society cannot function without them because everyone's trying, at the same time, everyone's trying to get to, you know, be doctors and lawyers, but we don't need all doctors and lawyers all the time. You know what I mean? We need somebody to go to your house when your toilet's clogged. You need somebody to fix a sewer underneath. You need people to build the houses and things like that, but you don't see them because they're, nobody wants that job, you know? And so I think as far as ethics goes, people, since they have that twisted sense of, uh, I need to get that, they're willing to do whatever it takes to get there, and if that means stepping on a few throats or cheating or whatever, some people they can justify whatever they want to get what they need in the end. You know, but that's capitalism for you. If people who are trying to be well-rounded should take a, a mixture of both to you know blossom into both an intellectual and a cultured person because that's truly a smart person is a mixture of both those things. So you should never you should try and stay away from doing all electives or just doing all core classes. I'm sure but a lot of people do that just to get the good grade and get in a good college where they can then blossom depending on what the college offers. But for the most part in high school, I would say a mixture was m much better than all or none. I think yeah. that, um, I think unfortunately we have taken out all the electives and we forced everybody into the box of academics. And you don't really get a chance to see what it's like to do other interesting things and how they can make you more well-rounded and more it make it a more enjoyable experience in high school you you know we've taken away auto mechanics taken away um, pretty much sewing and woodworking there's very few classes left where you actually have to work with your hands and design things and it it's kind of a shame because it really does fulfill you in a different way uh, I think it is sad because it really cuts out the room in their um, school day uh, to be creative and to kind of do that work. So if you have somebody who's, you know, taking five AP classes and, you know, doesn't have room for an artistic elective or um, like the elective that they might want to take should they have fewer classes or even not in school, somebody who used to take art classes or used to take music lessons that had to drop that because their workload in high school was too much. Um, I think it's, it's sad that it takes that away from them. Um, I think it does depend on the individual and their intentions. Um, some students will know kind of right off the bat that, you know what, they're really college bound. They need to take their maths and sciences all the way through four years, and so they may not have that chance to take elective classes, where others may kind of think, maybe college isn't quite what's for me, so having the elective courses does show them other opportunities um, as far as education goes. <clears throat> I think that if you're going to take an academic course in math, you are going to learn at a higher level for the academics. Um, but there's so much math to be learned in other courses because you can learn through music. 
you can learn through uh, mathematics is involved in almost everything in science. So all of these different courses, engineering, drafting, uh, auto mechanics, all of those courses require you to do math. And so I would think um, that they would have higher you know, skills, good math skills, that would be in a practical way. They may not have the higher level math, but they'd have practical level math. And I'll, I'll tell you, a lot of our kids who take higher level math have no practical sense. And you get the practical sense by doing those electives. And so we're kind of missing out on that, I think. Have you got to work these books in your hand? Come up and get your work quietly. Quietly, you just guess what's going to start with your notes, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is funny. I like that one. Huh. <laughs> hmm. I should have turned mine in. That's better than these. <laughs> Is school preparing kids to just become you know, followers or you know, good workers? And, and I think sometimes that's a, that has been the, the case. My name is Jim Evans, and I am a teacher at West High School. I teach English or language arts. When we've made them drill, when we've made them be good test takers, um, when we've pushed, so even in my discipline, when we've pushed, say, in an English class, that the point is to memorize definitions of vocabulary words or to uh, be able to regurgitate facts from the plots of novels, etc. That kind of drill, low-level thinking stuff, um, I argue, is setting them up to be good workers. And many of them will be good workers. I mean, we'll need to be good workers. That's, that's a role a lot of people would fill. But I think the higher-level thinking that, um, that I, I try to you know, have take place in my class, and I'm sure I fail daily on that, but you know, I'm working toward is that ability to think. People come to school, some people go to school because they want to, but most people come to school because they have to. And if, if they're being forced to do something that they don't necessarily have an interest in, I'm not saying school as a whole, but you know, certain classes, because obviously nobody's interested in everything all the time, you know, then in that case, they're, of course, they're going to just be repeating the knowledge, but unless they're taking actual classes that they truly want to learn about, which there aren't, which is, because most people don't want to learn about chemistry, and they don't want to learn about those kind of things. They only do that to get into good colleges, is why the fact that all the electives and the things that people actually are interested in and allow them to be creative and learn on their own and not necessarily black and white, but there's more gray area for things, you know, that's why the, uh, it's so sad that they're going away. So, yeah, they are just being taught to, to repeat whatever they say just because they know they have to say it. Absolutely, I agree with that. Uh, I changed jobs about um, 20 years ago and became a teacher because I was really interested in, in working with kids. I've always come from a long line of teachers and I've always enjoyed teaching kids how to do things. I'm Betty Burkhardt and I teach uh, biology, biology honors and advanced placement environmental science here at West High School. Basically, I really enjoy it. Um, interacting with all the teachers, being able to do my own thing in my classroom is always fun. And as far as teaching the students, I want to teach them the basic knowledge that we're required to teach them, but also how to develop skills that will help them later in life. Um, and that learning is fun. It's a struggle and it's rewarding. And that we have a lot of things that, um, a lot of different topics that we cover and we can tie them into the real world. And I think that's where kids 
can then take that information out and go find things that they like to do or make connections. Why do I teach? Um, teaching is something that I've always thought that I would be interested in doing. Um, this position kind of presented itself. I'm a long-term sub right now. Um, and the opportunity has just opened doors for me to work with high school students and kind of show them my love of cooking. I think, first of all, I have a love of art, so that's why I like to produce art myself. I'm a working artist, and I want to pass that passion on to my students. I think it can make a great career potential for them. There's many, many, many careers available in the arts. And um, I, even if they don't make a career out of it, I think it makes it also a great hobby. Art enriches our life. It's our gift to the future and our link to the past. Why I teach? Um, I think I teach because there is something pretty amazing about that, that experience that happens when, when someone discovers something, when someone accomplishes something. Uh, it's just a thrill to see the growth in students, to see you know, where they come in in September and where they exit in, when summer comes. Uh, to know that something that happened in this class has made a difference, to see it showing up. In my class, we don't focus on repeating anything. It's uh, most everything that we do is application level. Even in my regular bio class, it's take the knowledge, not regurgitate it, but apply it to a new situation. But I think, unfortunately, uh, a lot of uh, because we are so test crazy in the United States, and they, for some reason, uh, the education people think that the only way to show that a school is good is to have a test score for students. We're being forced to teach to a test, not to teach the knowledge in depth so that the students understand how to apply it to other w facets of their life, but to regurgitate. And I, I horrified that we're doing that. It just really breaks my heart because we're really losing. I, I hope that that's not the case. My feeling is we're teaching them to think. Um, and if you go around classroom to classroom here on our campus, uh, what you'll see most days is interaction. And um, interaction should have something to do with a, a particular purpose related to an objective and, and standard within that subject. And so um, those interactions could be teacher and the entire audience of students, teacher asking questions, students responding, students asking questions, students responding. Yeah, in my discipline, so language arts or English, I think if I was just to boil down essentially what I'm trying to teach them is the basic skill of processing difficult texts, whatever those might be, fiction or nonfiction, but taking difficult texts, comprehending them, understanding them, and then formulating a response, both written and orally. Most of them will have a difficult time finding a future that doesn't involve language and words. So the more effective they are at comprehending the words that they encounter, uh, the more effective they are at developing a response, um, gener demonstrating their thinking about what they're reading, um, being able to write or, or verbally communicate that. I think that only serves them well in whatever avenue they pursue. So. I'm not really sure what they expect of me. and. Um, I'm not sure that it ranks so high on my priority list. I think that um, what I expect of myself is more important and um, whether or not I'm willing to push myself in school. And I think that if I find that I am willing to do those things, then I'll meet their expectations. Uh, I think administration expects us mostly to follow the rules and to score well on tests. And um, many teachers do that, but on a smaller scale, you know, follow the rules of their class, do well in their class, do your work, get good grades. What we do each and every day here is set an expectation that, you know, students sh should be thinking every day and, um, you know, analyzing. And it goes back to the things that I think, you know, we want to hang our hats on as a school, and that's, you know, teaching comprehension, teaching. Uh, communication and, and teaching critical thinking and um, so with that in mind as our goal um, and as a part of our mission statement I, I, I believe it's happening every day. I expect my students to come prepared every day. Uh, I would like them to do their homework because we build on it, but I would, I would expect them to come into class eager to learn, to be ready to experience a lot of different 
types of things, to be open-minded enough to work with any kind of uh, other kids' personalities, and to really um, look for the good in people and look for um, the good things that they can learn out of an experience and be very positive. That's what I would like them to bring to class. The purpose of homework, as far as I'm concerned, is to reinforce the knowledge and the lesson that you were given on any particular day. Because practice makes perfect. You're, you're an athlete is out of practice and they might do bear crawls or push-ups or jumping jacks, um, which are hard work and no fun. And yet when I go to a football game or basketball game, I never see an athlete actually do a jumping jack, push-up, or bear crawl on the court when they're playing the game, but they all would acknowledge they need the training to physically be prepared for the game when it comes. And uh, likewise, you might argue that the, the discipline, the rigor, the, the effort that school is intended to have, I'm not saying it's a perfect system, right, but it's intended to have, is in some ways that exercise that's preparing them to then be ready to play that game for whatever their next step is. Same thing applies to homework. You're not going to know how to solve those math problems until you practice how to do them. And then it will become second nature. Now, do all teachers assign homework just for the sake of assigning homework? I'm sure many of them do. Do they give you more math problems than you necessarily need to do? Sometimes I think that's true. If you get it after five assigned, five problems, why do you have to do 20? All that's doing, I think, many times to certain kids is just frustrating them. I know it. I know how to do it. So why do I have to spend another 35 minutes doing this other problem? I have shown you that I understand it. Um, depends on who you ask. If you ask the teacher, homework is all about reinforcing the lesson. It's all about um, pursuing your own education. If you ask a student, it's about getting the points. Homework? I think homework is really important, actually, because I know that if I just spent an hour in class and was expected to go home and remember everything, I wouldn't. Um, I think homework's like a good reinforcing tool. and. Like, I, I do think that sometimes we get too much, but I wouldn't want to have a class without homework either. Make it uh, applicable to what they need to do and what they need to know, and don't assign it for the sake of just giving somebody busy work. Because kids aren't that stupid, they can figure it out. I think everyone needs the same amount. I would not get such a high score on my tests and quizzes if I didn't do my homework. Um, that's definitely, personally, I do my homework, I pay attention in class, and I don't study so much because it's already there, like I've learned it. So I think that it's definitely more important to give a standard amount of homework across the board. I know if I was in a class and I had to do homework every day, but the person sitting next to me didn't, I would feel a little bit of animosity there. So I think that everybody should be treated equally. If I have to do homework, you should have to do homework. We take the same tests. Why shouldn't we do the same work? Kids who are up till 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning doing homework, something's wrong. 
maybe they bit off more than they can chew. Um, the kids who are taking four or five AP classes or honors classes are doing it so, again, it looks better so they can get into the college that they want to get into. Uh, I'd rather the, the, the kid find out what's of interest to them, what excites them, and not take an honors class for the sake of taking an honors class, to take the honors class because they're really interested in the material. If you're really interested and you like it, it's not going to take you three hours to get through it. Well, one way that I, I know a lot of people do is things like honors and AP classes, trying to give college level work earlier on so that maybe when we go to college, it won't be such as an extreme uh, divide between how we learned in high school and how we learned in college. Well, there's a lot of things they teach you about how to be college prepared. Like, they tell you to take certain classes, and they, they really do help as far as trying to find a school. They're very active. Most high schools tend to be because, you know, it looks good on there. So they're not really doing it for us. They're mostly doing it because it makes their, them look good. You know, if a, bunch of, if a bunch of students take a bunch of really high classes and they get into a bunch of good schools, like a majority of that, that makes the high school look really good. So obviously they're going to put emphasis on take college classes and do that. They're not doing it for us. They're doing it mostly for them. At least that's how I feel it is sometimes because they kind of just force us into doing things we wouldn't necessarily want to do, you know, like getting good classes or whatever. At least my position anyway. To, to think that they're going to do well on a standardized test because it's going to make the school look good is really unrealistic. There's a there's a, a percentage of kids that that's good enough for. But they're the kids that don't question anything and they do it because they're supposed to. It's the kids that don't do it because they're supposed to and question and need understanding. Those are the ones that you need to uh, to focus in on to get things to be understood and to motivate them and to get them to do the whys. We take a lot of classes so that it looks good on college applications. But in the end, it doesn't matter if you don't have the knowledge to back it up and the willingness to work hard at the good college that you got yourself into. Well, when kids are only doing, uh, doing it for the grade, they really aren't understanding uh, the bigger picture. They're not really getting the knowledge. And so what happens is they, they have book learning but then they can't turn around and apply the information in a new setting. And that's what we're really looking for when we look for kids to, to learn at a higher level. We're looking for them to understand the basics and then take the next step and apply it at, at a higher level. And that application is lost if all you're doing is just reading to pass the test. If you're just reading to pass the test, you don't understand what you're doing and then you can't really learn at a higher level. And eventually you get to a point where you can't go on. You just, you don't have the basic foundation. And so that's, uh, that's the real shame, is that they're kind of cheating themselves out of learning how to learn at a higher level. And you have to, the stuff that they do have to take, they have to understand, you have to get them to understand the, the practical, the, the reality and, and, and of why that class is necessary and what good it will do them in the future. Uh, kids question pretty much everything. They don't take things on face value as once upon a time they did. And you need to explain to them that Algebra is necessary because. Geometry is necessary because. Equate it with how they will be able to, how they will utilize it in their daily life. Um, I think by developing um, reading comprehension skills, uh, developing communication skills, um, developing critical analysis skills, um, I, I think that's what we provide. And. Um, yeah, what you're going to see, you know, on the letterhead is we're, you know, an institution that prepares our teenagers for college. Uh, but in reality, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily just college. It's it's a lot of you know other things that are possible as well. And um, the skills that we're preparing, you know, students within are are going to be, you know, the the most important reasons why they're successful in whatever venture they choose. So they're preparing you that way, and I've never had a class where the teacher didn't try to teach a life lesson, where they didn't stop and say, look, this is how it's going to be in the future, just to warn you, you know, prepare yourself for that. Whether we listen or not is a different thing, but I've never had a class where I didn't learn something outside of the state standards. History, but why are we doing this? You know, why are we reading this particular text, that particular novel? Um, 
and I can say it. In some ways, it doesn't matter. It, it, you know, there are some maybe cultural value. There's some cultural value to knowing perhaps some of the iconic American texts. You know, uh, knowing *To Kill a Mockingbird* and *Scout* and I mean *Romeo and Juliet*. There are certain things that are part of our culture. But the truth is, we can teach in my discipline, we can arrive at the skills that they need to a number of texts. So it becomes a matter of choosing something that I decide is relevant for the theme of the class, or again, maybe something that has cultural significance. And I do think that is a long-term life skill, that ability to differentiate shades of meaning. And when we talk about language, that's really kind of the key, that there's um, the more, um, I guess the more sh shades of meaning we have, the, the deeper our understanding. I always use an analogy that when, when my kids were little and learning to speak, and they learned the word ball, you know, an exciting moment in the young dad's life, like the kid can say ball, and then you find, you know, you're walking by and there's some apples on the counter and they point at them and they say ball, and then they see the grapes and that's a ball too, and then there's the, the globe and that's a ball, everything's a ball. And we realize they really, you know, they're not so smart because they're young little kids. And we wouldn't, ex we accept that when they're, you know, 18 months or whatever they are when they're learning to speak. But we want them to get older and be able to recognize the shades of difference, that there's a difference between an apple, an orange, a grape, a globe, even a basketball, a baseball, a softball, a training softball, you know, full-size softball, et cetera. That intelligence is making these shades of distinction. And, and I think language arts is so much about that ability and when we're looking at how uh, a particular word does shade meaning, does reveal opinion. Uh, I think this kind of thinking sets up the, the child of today to be the thinker of tomorrow. You know, assuming we can get them to embrace it and, you know, and accept that, and that's, of course, the, what we try to do. Well, I think it depends on the subject level and the teacher, how much they do that. Ideally, in any situation, you have a basis of what you're teaching sort of that helps the student achieve, and then there's that open end for their own creativity that gives them ownership. And especially in art classes, that's what I try to do is give them enough support in a project where I know most of them are going to succeed, and then enough open-endedness that they can go off and add their own element to it. To me, that's the ideal situation. So you're kind of scaffolding it until they're ready to fly away and do it on their own. Um, if you just gave them free reign in high school, most students would not succeed because they're not ready for that. You have to give them the foundation then for them to do whatever the work is, and then they can go on and create their, themselves or think themselves or write, write for themselves. And I think that's the ideal learning situation. There's enough support so that they have success, but enough openness so that they can create something on their own and feel that, hey, I can do this or I want to do this. That's part of playing the game. There is plenty that you can learn, and there's plenty that can be offered, and you have to take uh, you have to take the the opportunities that are presented, and work with them to the best you can for yourselves. And there are many opportunities out there, and you can't just sit back and wait for somebody to say, "Hey, you've got to get up off your duff, and you've got to do a lot of the work yourself," because there are too many of you, and not enough of us. And we can't walk you through it and hold your hand. You're going to have to just figure out what you got to do to be successful. And if you break something along the way, there are ways to fix it. And don't think that you can't get that diploma and you can't be successful because you, you, you failed a few things along the way. It can be done. I do think, depending upon the subject, you do, there are different things that have to be done. Um, but if, if all of the teachers kind of work with the idea that every student does learn different and kind of vary the type of lessons that they do, I think that's beneficial. But in some classes, like a math class, it's going to be a little bit harder to do more hands-on, where in like food science cooking, we can do hands-on every week to make sure that everybody's learning the information um, at, that's been taught. In my classes, I get a good cross-section. I get a lot of AP students. I got a, get a lot of middle achievers and some underachievers. And there's, I mean, as far as how they do in my classes, it's, it's also mixed up. I mean, a lot of the underachievers, uh, scholastic underachievers, do very well in art. They're very visually gifted. And so I really like finding something that they can do well, whereas maybe they haven't been given a lot of credit in other classes. In my art classes, if, they, if I find they have a visual gift, I push them. 
because this is finally something that they're good at and they're getting good grades and it makes them feel good. Likewise, some you know, really high achievers scholastically, this might be harder for them and they're not used to struggling a little bit. So it's kind of good for them to do that. And I also have some great AP students that are also good in art. So there's not just one way, but I get a cross section of my classes. It's not just all high level of students. There's all levels in them. It's hard. It's, um, you, you kind of start off, if you're starting off a new unit, you kind of do an overview and you can you need to monitor the kids so you have to have some activities where you can have time to walk around and really monitor what they're doing and question them so you can do little quick questions you can also look at their papers read their papers to see if they're understanding and over a period of maybe three or four weeks after the first of the school you begin to understand how different people um, need to be helped and so you may change what you do in terms of how you present the material. Uh, you don't want to lose the kids who are like audio or learners, you know, they get it like that, be learning. Um, other kids are like very, you know, have to take notes, have to write it down and so you try to do all sorts of different types of activities that engage everyone, art activities. I find out about my artists by letting us do something that deals with art and it's really interesting that they have these wonderful um, abilities to do art. Other kids like to write and some kids don't like to write at all and so uh, you have a multiple different types of um, assessments and different types of activities and then you need to spend some time one-on-one -on -one walking around the room and really helping them and, and you get to a point where you learn how best to help them at a certain point if you have time. Well, in the arts, it's really easy because we, when we present a lesson, we present it for all learning modalities. So we have demos, which they see us doing it. We have examples, so there's visual examples. Um, it's once they get started, it's all um, individual attention. We group instruct, and then we go around and help them individually. There's project sheets, so it's written on it. The instructions are also written. So I think there's every single modality that we can possibly cover, we do in art. So it's a natural for us. And it's a lot of production. So it's not just listening. They're actually doing what we've told them to do or suggested that they do. So once the instruction is done, then they're showing us whether they understood or not. And we go back and we teach it if they didn't get it. Oh, we're all different personalities, so so much. Um, well, as you know, Mr. Pasusic has a wonderful system that he uses. He has a phenomenal following. Every 10th grader I interviewed for GATE, that was the favorite class they had. and so. He is, he engages them in a way I never could. I just don't have that personality. Um, and so we all have different, different strengths. So some of us like to do um, certain types of activities more than others. Some of us are uh, uh, more kind of nurturing and guiding. Other people are very strict disciplinarians um, and get away with it by being funny or, uh, we just all have our own personalities and even within our subject area, we have six different bio teachers. We each have our own favorite way of doing things. We each have our own little techniques that we like to use that we share with people. It'll work great for this teacher, but does it work for me? You know, and so we, we, um, it's, that's what makes it so rich and interesting though, is because you can take an activity and you can mold it to your personality and your students and you can have great success even though it's a little different from someone else who they had very good success. That's what's fun about teaching is you get to really put your personality into it. And especially when there's so many people in a classroom, so many people taking a class, it's hard for a teacher to individualize a curriculum. So I think they do a really good job of it here but I don't think that it's possible to reach every student. Uh, there's a direct correlation between uh, class size and, 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 and grades and success and learning and achievement um, and, and ancillary services that assist kids. Um, all of those things immediately get cut. Um, it does not become really a sense of education and about getting the kids to learn as much as I think it is preparing kids for certain tests that they need to pass so school districts look good statistically. AP classes are designed so kids fare well on the AP test. Uh, classes are designed so kids pass the KC so the school looks good, that it has close to or 100% pass rate as it possibly can. Uh, corners are cut, things are done so kids can graduate. So it looks like the schools have 100% uh, graduation rate. Um, all you have to do is read Huff's book, How to Lie with Statistics, to figure out that there are ways to make things look much better on paper than they really are in reality. 
certainly we're, uh, what we're up against is a public and even government and you know, public perception that, that results in learning are measured by test scores. This is the one measurement we, we have and we can post an API score and we can show, look, we're improving. Our numbers are going up. It's very easy to quantify. And so, unfortunately, this is, this is an essential part of what we're being measured on. And so we have to strike that balance between um, we, want our kid, you know, if we want our kids to be able to do well in these tests, but we all uh, agree the key is the content and, and the skills that they're learning. So you know, and uh, the perfect test, for example, in my discipline would involve some writing. They would have to take a test, formulate a response, and that, that response could be assessed. Currently, that's not how the test works. Well, hopefully, I understand that. It's like rote learning. So that's learning for the test, which I, you know, in arts, we don't do, we don't do that because we present a product. So the product is there. It's not just the test. If they can't produce the product, they're not getting the knowledge. So it's not just a multiple choice test that they're getting. So we don't usually have that problem as much in the arts, but I totally can understand that. And there are times when, I mean, I don't agree with that totally, but even in arts, there's, there's times when you have a project deadline and you need to get it done. So you need to figure out a way to get it done on time, and that happens all the time in college. You're overloaded with projects. Maybe you can't be your most creative self, but it's survival. And so that in and of itself is a lesson to learn. However, I do think that in most classes, you want to have that intrinsic bond between the knowledge and the grade. You don't want to just feel like you're going for the grade because then there is no value to it. So I, I understand what you're saying. It makes me sad if that's the way students feel. Sometimes that's reality, but hopefully it's not the whole reality. Well, we can change the test. We used to have a really interesting test here in California called the Golden State Exam. And students built a portfolio throughout the year. So they did maybe 10 different things in a biology class, 10 different uh, labs that uh, they did, or writing assignments or whatever. And then at the end, they would build this portfolio. They'd pick and choose three different things to do in to put in the portfolio. And then we also had a GSE test, Golden State Exam test, where they had to perform a lab activity. And with that lab activity, they gathered data, they uh, made interpretations, and came to conclusions. Now, to me, that would be an excellent test to compare one teacher to another and to see if the kids really learn something. But the test they're taking right now is strict regurgitation. It's, it's 60 questions to cover an entire year of, of learning, which is ridiculous to me. Um, so we could change the test. That's one thing we could change to make it so that the kids had some input into it. They had some stake in making it a better um, score. Because right now, there's no, there's no stake for them at all. It's strictly the motivation by outside people saying, you must do well. And we're being pressured to really give kids incentives, changing grades uh, to, to make them do well. And it seemed, that seems totally wrong. It's like bribing a kid. And it bothers me badly. <laughs> because in reality, what does standardized testing do for you? It doesn't actually um, prove that you're going to do better in life. It doesn't, and it doesn't prepare you for anything. You know, being able to take a test well doesn't prepare you for any job, really. Um, so I think that gearing education away from test taking and more towards actual um, learning and being able to apply that learning um, all across the board would be more helpful. I think that there's a lot of, that right now people are down on teachers a lot. And I feel like we're, we're getting a bum rap. Of course, there are really excellent teachers, and there are, more, there are weaker teachers. But I think that it's not just a teacher problem. There's a family problem. You need family support to get education to improve. Um, if kids aren't doing their homework or if they have a, a horrible family life, it's really hard for them to come to school and be excited about learning. So it's not just one problem. I think that um, the determinations of just a test and test scores to see how well we're teaching is a bad way to go. I think it's one factor. I don't think it's the only factor. I think we need individual um, relationships with our students. So as soon as we start to increase class size, that makes it really, really difficult. Um, you can only run around the room so many times when you have 40 kids in the classroom. So smaller class sizes, remember that it's, it's a global problem, not just a teacher-driven problem. And I think we can make education better. I come to school because I can't imagine myself being anywhere else. I can't imagine myself um, having a job because I don't feel like I'm, I've got the right 
preparation for that. I can't imagine myself just laying at home because I know I wouldn't get anything done. Um, I think this, that school's the place where I can be the most productive. I know most people would say because I have to or, uh, you know, to learn. But um, I think that it's just what you do. It's what everybody does. There's not really an option. Um, I like coming to school. I don't always like it, but uh, in the grand scheme of things, I'd rather be coming to school than, you know, working at 14 or doing something else, so. You go here to learn more about learning, you learn about learning pretty much, yeah, and socially and study habits, again, because, you know, high school is different than middle school is different than kindergarten is different than elementary school, you know, all those kind of things, you know, and college too, because college is a much more social environment, but it's, it's different, you know. The high school is much more like, you know, snippy and all that. Whereas college, everyone's a little bit more mature, but just as snippy. But they just act better about it. <laughs> At least that's what I've seen. The purpose of high school is to grow up. And it's to give you practice for the next phase, which is either getting a job or going to college. And I think as high school teachers, we're um, teaching them responsibility. Uh, they need to become organized, deadlines, how to manage their time. It's all of those things. So the idea of grades and knowledge, it's the same thing. You kind of mentioned that to me a little bit earlier. We're imparting knowledge. And then we want to see how well they can assimilate that knowledge, use that knowledge. And then the grade becomes the, our, our um, assessment of how they did. And that's so much like life. Life is competitive. And when you get out there, you might have 10 people going for the same job. So they need to be organized. They need to be on time. They need to present themselves well. And all of those things we're assessing and trying to teach in high school. Responsibility, arriving to class on time. If you go to a job and you continually arrive late, the boss is going to fire you. You know, so if you um, have a client and you forget that your homework, you forget the, um, the product at home, they're not going to pay you. So I think high school is just, it's another way of learning to grow up. It's another step. College is the next level, or any job that you get is another level. So there are stepping stones to becoming mature and taking responsibility for the choices you make in your own life. You're learning to deal with other people, with your peers, with people who are above you, whether it's the teachers or administration. Um, because in life you're going to grow up, you're going to get a job, maybe you have, um, you're going to go to college, so you'll have professors and people that you're going to deal with more than just on a peer level. And so I think high school is also teaching that to the students because sometimes there are going to be situations that arise where you have to do things, you have to listen to somebody, a boss. Um, and so it's just pulling into that that, you know, it's not all just going to be peers. There are going to be people above you that you're going to have to deal with as well. To prepare students uh, for college or career readiness, to be ready for either college or for career, but to prepare them, like, again, in my discipline for that, that thinking skill, that working with words, writing, being able to write effectively and clearly, being able to read difficult texts and negotiate them. And so preparing them for that college or career world, whatever that is for them. It teaches you to deal with things you hate really well. Because there's no way out of it unless you're going to like, you know, take the easy route and that's a good person, a moral character won't. So if you deal with something that you hate for long enough, eventually you learn how to cope with it and life's going to be filled with things you hate. And so high school, if, if that's just one way to look at it, if you don't want to look at any of the academics, it'll teach you to deal with things that you hate to do that you have to. Is school about getting the grade or gaining the knowledge? I think, um... School should be, of course, about getting the knowledge. And I think there are plenty of students for which there, there is an appreciation for the knowledge that they gain. But often it, it becomes about getting the grade, I think, for a lot of kids. Um, you know, they're overwhelmed with a lot of classes and expectations and the increasing difficulty they see to get into colleges and universities and their future is on the line. And so they often have to cram in a lot of activities and, and extra classes and I think it becomes sometimes a little too overwhelming but on the other hand I think they appreciate it when they sense they're learning something of value versus jumping through the hoops knowledge oh I've always believed that school is about getting the knowledge um, because you know a grade is just a letter and it's not even consistent across the board a, a West isn't the same thing as an A at North or South or Torrance or PV. It's all different and because of that I think you, we need to focus on the knowledge that we get from these individual classes. 
um, because in the end, the A isn't going to get you through life. It's the knowledge, what you took from that class, the life lessons that's going to get you through life. I think it's about getting the grade, um, mostly because I've always been goal-oriented, and my goal is to get into college. And so um, for that, you really need the good grades. Uh, I can see there's an argument to be made that uh, getting the knowledge is important to getting the grade, but I think priority-wise, getting the grade comes first. For me, it's both. They're intertwined. I don't think it, you can put one without the other, especially in high school, because you're going through a program that's preparing you for the next step. And so to me, the knowledge comes first. You want to start getting the knowledge. And then the grade is the assessment of how well did you learn the knowledge? How well can you use the knowledge? Was the knowledge valuable for you? And it's also, it's, it's like the boss. It's the client telling you, OK, you did a good job, or no, you need to do more. It's did you do it on time? Did you do it well? Did you follow the criteria? Did you even understand the knowledge? So in, from, in my mind, they're intertwined. They go together, and even in the arts. And I get students a lot of time that try to sell me on the, the idea that, oh, I'm an artiste, and I can't turn in something on time. And I say, well, if you have a job or a client, you're going to have to. You know, a musician needs to learn the music on time for the concert. A dancer has to learn the choreography and after the lines. So it's the same thing with an artist. They have to get the, the product done on time, otherwise they won't get paid. So to me, they go hand in hand. Because you're always going to be graded. No matter what you do in life, you're graded. Your boss is going to grade you. Your client's going to grade you. Someone else is going to have an opinion. So it's just getting you ready for that, which happens all the time in life. So they're both, t they're both mixed together. Well, I think nowadays, more about getting the grade than getting the knowledge, because people will take a class just because it's hard, not necessarily for the, the knowledge that they would gain because they're trying to get into a good college to make money even though there's already a hundred thousand doctors out there you know way more than we need not necessarily a hundred thousand but you know a large number of doctors but there's a lot of people that don't go to trade school and do things that still need to be done because everyone's trying to achieve something that they everyone else wants just to make money so yes I would say more for the classes or more for the grade than the knowledge to me school is about getting the knowledge I really strongly feel that students should learn how to learn, that we need to train their brains how to become critical thinkers. I mean, I, I know a lot of people use those buzzwords, but it's so true. I think struggling is really important because all throughout life you're going to struggle with problems. I would much rather have a kid take a, a challenging class and learn a lot and not do as well as far as a grade goes than to take a very easy class, get an easy A, and not learn anything. I, don't, I think you've wasted time in that case. To the State Board of Education, I, I, I don't think there's anything that I can tell them that they don't already know, uh, provided that they've all been educators and not just politicians. Because a politician has no idea what it's like to be an educator. You can look at things from up above and, you know, throw out suggestions, uh, but unless you've been in the trenches, you really don't know what it's like. And for me sitting here uh, with a caseload of 750 kids, and there's three counselors for 22, 2300 kids, when just two years ago there were five of us, and um, our jobs were a little bit different, I don't have the opportunity to, to be uh, proactive anymore. It's just about being reactive. Um, a, a kid who's in trouble is not going to come down to me and say, hey, I'm in trouble. What do I need to do? The kid who is eager to go to college and, and eager to be successful is going to be the one that comes down here to get additional advice and additional information. And they're the ones that don't need it as much. But I can't get to the ones that need it uh, because I just I don't have the time. And as dedicated as I am, I'm not going to be working 80 hours a week to, to do these things. That's unrealistic. I'm not going to burn myself out and be no good to anybody because I'm overdoing it. I can't pick up the slack for two other councils that don't exist here. And if you think that I'm supposed to do that, then you need to get your head out of your, your, your own butt to figure that out. I'm, I can't do it, and I'm not going to. Certainly not at my age. Okay. Um, it's frustrating as hell, and you have to keep these walls up because you, you, you need to keep your emotions out of it, or else the entire system is just going to eat you up, and you are going to die an early death and be of no value to anybody. That's all I'll say about that. Just really consider funding 
for our public schools. We're, we're working really, really hard out here, and um, you know, the state is in, in a difficult spot, and we recognize that, um, but it's time for some financial change, and you know, uh, hopefully watching this video is, is going to make an impact on that, and recognizing you know, how serious we take the job that we do each and every day, and um, how important each of these students is for us. About anything? Yes. I would say the biggest challenge right now especially in, in my area, is if we want our, we want our future um, adults to be able to think clearly, to go the right well, and to read complex text. You know, the only way they can do that is, is to practice it and do it and practice it and do it. And that, in my discipline, generates, a, it's a lot of work to do that. Uh, I can only put in three you know, I can, I can do three days for 12 or 13 hours, you know, where I go straight home and I grade essays until 9 or 10 at night, and then I get up the next day and do it. But that third day, my, that level of evaluation, and uh, so a student writes something, I have to then pull out the best models to show the kids who didn't quite get there what it looks like. I have to generate the lesson to follow up to teach the skills further, to, to advance the skills further. By about the third day, I just you can't do it anymore. And, um, and then there's a the weekend time. So when I have you know, the 40 kids in a class, you know, 40 times 5, so 200 kids uh, to, to try to work with, it begins to limit how much I can actually have them do that. And that is, that's been, it's been a tough couple of years. I've, I've been working harder than I've ever worked to the point of unhealthiness, trying not to lower standards, trying not to um, do a, a worse job than last year. I don't know how much longer I can keep that level up. At some point, you know, do we, do we go back to, well, it's time to watch the movie now for a couple days because we read the book and now the movie's not gonna, you don't need me to watch the movie, I shouldn't be showing it, but is, is there a point at which it's impossible to keep up with the paper load to do, to do a, a good and great job? I, how often should a kid be writing? Once a week? Twice a week? You know, well, if it's 200 and it's 200 once a week, I've got to try to get through that. I, you know, I can get through uh, maybe 80 uh, papers a night. So twice a week, I, it starts to become out of the realm of reality. Uh, so if, to a school board, to a public, I would say um, there, there's just, for language arts, there's, there's too many. 40 is too many kids to try to do this job well. If you want them to practice, if you want them to be effective at reading, thinking, and writing. Hmm. Do what you love because you love to do it, not because you're told you have to do it. And if you want to make money and be a doctor to help people, then you do it. But if you're making, if you're, if you want to do something because you want to make money, you should relook at your motives. You know, everyone has a place in society. Everyone, whether they're like the lowliest, you know, sewage guy worker or the the highest CEO, everyone has plays an important role, and one can't survive without the other. So, to say that one job is any better than the other is completely wrong, in my opinion. And if you want to do something, then you get out there and do it. And if it happens to be that you want to be a veterinarian, you be a veterinarian. If you want to do construction, to do construction. But you should never let anyone else tell you what you need to do, as far as you know, what you love to do.